It's a real pleasure for me to be able to come visit with you about the NRCS and our partner campaign to improve soil health. And I enhance the really kind of highlight the word partner there because although NRCS has a number of tools available for us to help enhance our, the health of our nation's soils, we also realize that we're not going to do it alone. We really rely on those partnerships of farm groups, soil and water conservation districts, land grant universities, and many, many others uh, to help make this happen. You've all been hearing the story this morning. One of the things we're faced with with our current population in the world of around 7 billion people expected to increase to over 9 billion people just by the year 2050. So our experts are telling us in the next 40 years, we're going to have to grow as much food to sustain that population growth as what we have grown in the last 500 years. But at the same time, we're losing farmland at an, at an amazing rate, an astounding rate. If you'll look at this, this is changing the uh, amount of urban land that's increasing is what this is showing between 1982 and 2007. Just watch the changes. It's changing in five-year increments. During that 25-year period between 1982 and 2007, we lost over 40 million acres of rural land. 23 million acres of that was active agricultural land. 14 million acres of that is prime farmland. That, farm, that land that's best used for farming, that's least erosive, that would require the least amount of inputs in order to sustain the, our food needs. And so while we need to grow all this food for this burgeoning population, we are having to do it on a shrinking available land base. At the same time, we're asking more and more of our production systems. We're not only asking that they help us grow this food for this burgeoning population on a shrinking available land base, but we're also asking that, we, that they help us reduce our dependency on foreign uh, supply of uh, oil and other sources of energy. So we're looking at them for bio, or growing our bioenergy crops. And we've also learned that we just cannot ignore pollinators. We rely on pollinators for over 30% of our food supply. 30%. And it's not just as easy as having a crop that blooms because you have to provide habitat throughout the season. So you have to provide multiple species that bloom at different times and have different textures. It's much more uh, more complicated uh, than many of us think it is, but it's extremely important that we also provide that habitat for our pollinators while we're trying to grow all this food. And farmers have always been cognizant and aware of the importance of water quality. They drink from wells too, right? Many of them. And, but just so they have always had this interest and they've always had this emphasis, but this emphasis is even more accentuated as we get more and more of the urban lands that are moving into our rural landscapes. We also know that our water supply is finite and there's increasingly more competition for those water resources. And so the quantity issue is huge. We know it's huge here, right? And so it's extremely important that with the limited amount of water we have, we use it as most efficiently as possible. And then we get nature's curveballs. Right? The historic drought of 2012. The drought they're currently experiencing in California right now. But do you all remember what was happening in the midsection of the country a year earlier, 2011? Floods, right? I heard someone over here say it. Floods. The lady from South Dakota, Dr. Sharon Clay, she said it. Floods. And so essentially what you've been hearing about this morning feeds right into this. We need to build resilience of our production systems, resilience into our production systems. And so as Tina Turner would say, what's soil health got to do, got to do with it? <laughs> and the answer of course is everything. <laughs> Sorry man, that's a one time. <clears throat> And you notice, I would not, well, I would not have done it on the webcast, I'll tell you that. Uh, 
But we know that improving soil health can increase water infiltration. You know, in the, in the, in the rhizosphere under our plants, uh, we have these root exudates. We have really active microorganisms, uh, microflora that, that are so active in that rhizosphere and their decomposition products and their exudates, they essentially form these biotic glues. And they take those individual sand, silt, and clay particles and bind them into aggregates, right? Now when we get more aggregation, then water can infiltrate more into the soil. We know that um, when we get better aggregation, that soil is more resistant to erosion. We can get easier uh, root penetration. We can get more oxygen uh, to those roots. So uh, improving soil health has such a tremendous benefit for helping increase water infiltration and other related properties. We also know there's a relationship among sand, silt, and clay and organic matter content to enhance water holding capacity. So over the long term, and it can, depending on your cropping system, depending on your carbon inputs and how much you're stirring it up, if you're not tilling, if you are significantly adding carbon inputs like, you know, keeping the soil covered, a lot of crop residue, uh, cover crops, um, if you're adding manure to it, then that's a way to really enhance that organic matter content in the soil quickly. The quicker you can do that, then the more you will derive those benefits of that increased available water holding capacity and therefore that enhanced resilience of that production system to these extreme weather events. So if we're going to have more water infiltration, we're going to have less runoff, right? And so that just inherently improves the water quality. You're going to have less sediment that's removed. We're going to have uh, less nutrients that are removed. We also know for the same biological activity, a lot of those nutrients particularly nitrogen, but also phosphorus to a certain degree, is tied to a carbon. When the microorganisms are feeding on carbon for their, for their, nutri for their energy source, well, they're releasing the nitrogen phosphorus, so they're enhancing this nutrient availability. We also know that a number of our chemicals uh, can be basically detoxified as those microorganisms feed on them. And if we do things like no-till, where there's fewer passes across the field, you can kind of extend this on out uh, to fertilizer requirements and these types of things um, for uh, saving energy. And then all this really goes to improving plant health also. It's not just that you have a greater diversity of microorganisms in the soil, because what that can do is help you um, control essentially some of the soil-borne pathogens, soil-borne organisms that are in the soil. There's just a stronger community essentially uh, to, uh, to control those pa plant pathogens. But there are also particular crops that we can grow, put in our cropping systems to help us increase plant health. Some of the crops called brassicas, things like mustards, radishes, uh, canola, canola is a big one. They have a compound in them called uh, glucosinolate. This glucosinolate decomposes into another compound called isothiocyanate. You hear the formative elements of the word cyanide in there, isothiocyanate. And so what this is, is it's really a natural fumigant uh, to help control some of these soil-borne pathogens. And of course, we can all do this, get, drive all these benefits by, while maintaining or even increasing yield. So that's why we at NRCS are putting our arms uh, and holding hands uh, with a number of partners all across this great country and really jumped in both, both feet into our soil health campaign. And so I just want to use this opportunity to just kind of step you through a few of the things uh, that we are doing and working with our partners on. One of them we heard him mention, Chief Jason Weller mentioned earlier, was the need for ensuring the scientific basis for everything we're doing. That's extremely important. We, we can learn so much from our farmers and ranchers. In many respects, they are, are the leaders, and in many respects, we're trying to catch up. But we also need to understand the scientific basis and principles for some of those improvements that they are observing and that they are achieving. And we need to do these by studies. We need to do it you know, by searching the literature, because that helps us understand how far we can generalize it. Can we generalize it into this climatic zone or not? Can we generalize it, you know, with irrigated systems or not? Uh, with manured or not? With no-tilled or not? I mean, so by understanding the, basically the scientific basis for all of this, it's going to really help us um, understand kind of the breadth uh, of our recommendations for farmers and ranchers. 
And so we are working very closely under Dave Smith's leadership with the Soil Science and Resource Assessment Division and NRCS, having some of our scientists in that division conducting uh, literature reviews, also working with our ARS uh, partners for conducting literature reviews, for helping us make sure that we have our, really our hands around uh, the state of the science on this. We're also working with a number of folks on evaluating the economics. Uh, you heard um, uh, Rob Myers was talking about some of the economic evaluations that SAIR, CTIC are doing uh, with that um, uh, survey that they've been running the last couple of years. That's extremely important. We also, through our Conservation Innovation Grants program with NRCS, uh, just last year awarded a Conservation Innovation Grant to CTIC, Conservation Technology Information Center, uh, to help um, do an economic analysis on uh, the potential profitability of these cover crops. Now, we've heard about it uh, earlier today, and I'm one of those people on that same bandwagon that thinks it's it, looking at being able to demonstrate potential profitability is hugely important because that's really what's going to change, you know, adoption because that's the farmer's bottom line, right? But I'm on that same bandwagon that has to think that to the extent that we can quantify the reductions in economic risk, then it just makes sense to me that it should follow that if something is a lower risk, then perhaps one day that may show up in reduced insurance premiums or reduced loan interest rates, if in fact we can quantify and demonstrate there is that reduced risk. I think a, uh, a really good surrogate for that economic risk is yield variability. And that's, that's pretty easy, pretty easy to measure. It takes a little time, but it, I think it is a real good surrogate measure uh, for economic risk. How, much, how variable is that yield if you do these practices compared to these other conventional practices where you're not trying to enhance soil health? I think our resiliency that we're building in our production systems by increasing soil health, I think it will show up there. Uh, some of the research I used to do in Maine uh, with ARS as a scientist there, it, it definitely showed up there. And it, it gives me faith that it will show up elsewhere also. Another thing that we are working on is really modeling the benefits. Really try to kind of set those goalposts for helping us all understand, you know, what we can achieve. Some of our conservation effects assessment projects, uh, modeling efforts, have showed us that there's still about 146 million acres of cropland that's still in need of moderate to high levels of additional conservation treatments. And our modelers started saying, okay, what if we added no-till to that? What if we added cover crops to that? What could we achieve? And the answers, I, you know, I know you all think I'm corny, but the hair's standing up on my arms, I'll tell you right now. The, the answers was that we could, we could save 116 million tons of soil per year from being lost. We could save 11 million tons per year of carbon from being lost. We could save 1.9 billion pounds of nitrogen from being lost. So that's nitrogen that's not making its way into our waters. That's carbon that stand on the soil to help us build that resiliency, to help us maintain and build that available water holding capacity, that help us, gives us those aggregates that we were first starting to talk about, right? And so the potentials are huge. Another thing we're doing in RCS is making sure that our conservation innovation grants priorities, priorities that we're funding through our modest uh, innovation grants program. It ranges usually from about 15 to $30 million a year um, that we contribute, but then there's a 50-50 match, so it's about a 30 to $60 million effort uh, annually at, at a minimum. We are ensuring that our priorities are lined up very closely with this. And so the announcement just came out, what, about two weeks ago? Any of you are interested, I encourage you to go on our website now and check it out. I think the pre-proposals are due I think in a couple of weeks, please don't hold me to that. I don't remember the exact date. Um, but we are, we are asking for things like um, 
projects that quantify and demonstrate this increased available water holding capacity through these soil health enhancement efforts. And we're asking folks to look at it for different parts of the landscape, you know, different sections of the country, different types of cropping systems, so that again, we can kind of figure out how widely we can generalize these relationships and so how much confidence we can have in our recommendations with working with landowners to adopt these practices to achieve these benefits. Another thing we're doing is they're leveraging our plant material centers. NRCS is, is blessed with having uh, many different plant material centers across the country. And just this last year, we uh, launched uh, under uh, John Englert's leadership. He's here in the room somewhere. Uh, John is our national leader of plant materials program. And under his leadership, we launched a project involving seven of these plant material centers where they are conducting a coordinated project across different climatic zones, different soils, uh, looking at many different types of uh, cover crop species mixes, different rates, you know, two species, four species, six species, and then their impacts on soil properties also. So we're trying to really use that network of PMCs so that we have available to us and capitalize on the network, again, to see how much we can generalize these relationships, you know, across climatic zones and different types of cropping systems. And the national training has been huge for us. In the last um, six months, uh, we have trained over 2,300 people, around 1,746 actually uh, were NRCS employees, and the rest uh, have been partners and, um, and NGOs, uh, farmers, ranchers. But our real effort has been just really focusing on training NRCS employees because we're using that you know kind of train the trainer approach. And, and so when we get, get all of them trained, then they're kind of, you know, be unleashed on the countryside, so you might want to wear your flak jacket, uh, be prepared. Uh, no, we, one of the things that we just did just last week was have a, uh, uh, a webinar with these folks all around the country to help ensure that if they are kind of swamped, with folks leaving this conference and from observing the webcast uh, this morning, with people coming in the door wanting to know, you know, how do I sign up? What practices should I use? Then our folks in NRCS offices are well equipped and well versed on what those practices are to help them achieve, you know, that soil health, um, those soil health goals. Because it's, you know, it's not just a, it's not really a cookbook type of approach, because although we have these principles you know, like disturbing the soil last and, you know, keeping the diversified, you know, plants above ground so you keep diversity under the ground, et cetera. We also have to do this within the context of the different cropping systems and production systems that the farmer or rancher is working with. And so it's, um, it, it does take a certain level of creativity and understanding of how we apply those practices within the context of a system that will work for the landowner. So we, we have to be there. And so then we are also doing a number of things with our partnerships, of course. This is a big one. Uh, look around you. Uh, this was a, a great one for us here. We were just so excited with all the number of folks that have already been uh, recognized uh, that we were able to partner with them for this. And you've also heard we partner with RMA and FSA um, in an effort that I was uh, uh, honored to be able to lead on trying to make sure that when our conservation planners prescribe cover crops that they are not inadvertently getting a, a farmer at odds with their crop insurance issues. And so we do develop some national cover crop termination guidelines. Uh, we understand there are still some issues in the summer fallow systems uh, that we have a team that is actually scheduled to meet uh, this coming May. Uh, to work on those issues, to really define that state of the science, what it tells us, and if we should do any adjustments in the, for the summer fallow systems. Uh, but there's a lot of flexibility in there in those. Uh, we're very pleased to work with our partnerships um, that we have with uh, National Corn Growers, Monsanto, Environmental Defense Fund, the Nature Conservancy, a number of universities uh, that we are helping provide some technical advice into their soil health types of partnership also that they are doing. So they're, they're, those are just some, our National Association of Conservation Districts, uh, we have a partnership with them, uh, National Grazing Lands Coalition, and so this gives you a feeling for the breadth, I think, of this movement uh, that we are all a part of. 
And then communications is a big part. And I'll just very quickly to go through, make sure that you are aware of some of these resources that are available to you. If you go to the NRCS website, uh, you will see something that says soil health. Click on that. That'll take you there. There's a number of eight places where you can like download fact sheets. Please download as many as you want, distribute them, whatever you want. Um, there are also a number of them are available in Spanish. And some of the more powerful information I think we have on there are some of the farmer testimonials. Those producers' experiences, you know, you, you were here, you saw how powerful it was, you know, hearing from the gentleman this morning uh, on how they overcame some of the barriers and how, they, how it's enhanced their operations. So those, uh, many of those testimonials are there on video and on handouts. And then I also want to, though, point this to you. Um, when I came to NRCS about three and a half years ago, what I learned was that we were starting to accumulate a number of webinars, but they were all over the country. Well, we consolidated those into one place we call in our science and technology training library. And then about a year ago, I was, we were able to find a site where they could be posted and made available to everybody around the world, not just USDA employees. And we currently have over 160 webinars on here, and over 20 of them um, focus on soil health. There's even one on there that uh, from some snake oil salesman named Honeycut. If you, that's one you might want to avoid. But, <laughs> but they are, uh, I mean, they are just a tremendous, you know, kind of resource for you because you can go in at any time. You have the time. Uh, you can do a search if you're interested in water quality, nutrient management, soil health. And you can see some of these experts, many of them from universities, NRCS, ARS, uh, that we have been able to record. And uh, you can download them and view them at, at, at your leisure. So I was just in there um, with uh, probably I shouldn't uh, go into all the depth with explaining uh, this uh, picture. Just to say that this is one of the things, reasons why I am so um, convinced that we do have a future here for enhancing the health of our nation's soils uh, just by seeing these types of improvements that we were able to do when I was a scientist in Maine uh, with ARS. And I will also like to say, if I have one more minute, please, is that, you know, to me, I think enhancing the health of our nation's soils is one of the most important things that we could do for this and for future generations. And that's not just because it will give us a fighting chance at basically growing all this food for this burgeoning population on a shrinking available land base, but it also helps us address simultaneously so many of the most pressing natural resource needs that we have. It helps us address water quality, helps us address nutrient availability, it helps us address our ability to grow these bioenergy crops and therefore become more energy independent. It, um, it helps, I think, with the economics of production systems. and. It, it helps us with carbon sequestration. It helps us address pollinator habitat, other wildlife habitat, because they drink water too. They, they depend on quality water also. Um, but, you know, and then the bottom line, I guess it kind of gets back to people too, and, and what our chief said, is that because all of this, when, when a farmer is doing well, then the rural economy is also doing well. We know that ties, and, and we know that that connection is there. And it's not just the fertilizer dealers and the seed dealers, uh, but it's, it's the banks, it's the restaurants, it's the churches, it's the entire kind of rural fabric of the community. And so uh, I'm not trying to philosophize too much into this, but I would just say I think that they're all connected. And I observed that connection when I uh, mapped soils in the Appalachian region many years ago in eastern Kentucky. I could tell the quality of the soil, that relationship with the quality of the house uh, that folks were living in there, in, in that region. It was, it was very clear. And so um, I think it's one of the most important endeavors that you all could be joining with us to do uh, this time. And I uh, thank you for your attention. Turn it back over to you, Jim. Thank you.